we left off, the chief of staff, the leading general for David is Yoav. The leading general, the chief of staff for the house of Saul, Shaul, now through the one remaining son of Shaul who's alive, Ishbosheth, that man is Avner. He's the chief of staff. There was that conflict in the last class in which Avner sort of said, let the, they, they had a situation where 12 of the Avner men and 12 of the Yoav men happened to encounter. They just happened to be in the same place. And Avner said, why don't they have some fun? Let's, uh, let's, let's, let them go play, have a play fight. And that turned into a tragedy, um, became a battle, started as a play fight, ended up with people killing each other. All 12 of the people from House of David, all 12 from the House of Saul died, ended up killing each other. And it turned into a bigger fight than that. There were more fighters, aside from those who were up front, and suddenly, all of those people start, the Avner House of Saul people started to flee. And the David people, having defeated the Saul people, were going to leave it alone, maybe. But one person, Asael, the brother of Yoav, the general of David, Asael, who is fleet of foot, extremely fast, again, the brother of Yoav, the general, pursued Avner and caught up with Avner. And Avner begged him, leave me alone. Don't fight with me. Not that Avner was afraid of him, but Avner knew he's going to end up killing him. And he doesn't, Avner does not want to kill the brother of Yoav. This has been a disastrous day. People have died all over the place. Jews have been killing Jews. There was really no need for it. Ishbosheth has been raised up and elevated to be the king over all the tribes but Yehuda, Judea. David is, in, is the leader of Yehuda, and these two sides are not at war, and now they are at war. And the last thing Yoav wants is to have to kill Asael. But if Asael is coming at him with a sword or a spear, he's going to have no choice, and he doesn't want to do it. And he practically pleads with Asael back off. Asael insists, and Yoav hits him, uh, Avner hits him with the back of the handle of his spear, but by God's miracle, for God's purposes, it still killed Asael. It smote him just in the spot near his liver, in his fifth bone down near his liver, and he just got hit in the wrong spot. And I gave the example of that football player with the Buffalo Bills, that a gazillion people get tackled hard, that once in 20 years or 50 years tackle that almost killed a guy. And that's where we left off. Now everybody's at each other, and Avner looks at Yoav and says, do we have to keep fighting? Like, how long is this going to go on? And Yoav says to him, I wish you had thought of that earlier today when you came up with that idea of having them start fighting. So Yoav backs off. He agrees, let's get out of here. And he's very upset that this whole thing unfolded. And so you have Yoav and the people of David going back to Judea, Yehuda. And you have the people of Benjamin under Avner going to like Machanayim, which is on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And that's where Ishboshet is right now. And that's where we left off. Things happen for a reason. This Shabbat, take a few minutes during the quiet of Shabbat. If you live alone, contemplate. If you live with a person, talk it over. And explore in your own life. Has something or things happened in your life, turning points? that are almost impossible to explain. I want you to know, I was thinking about it today during one of my endless medical procedures. So I was told that the doctor runs early, so we should come early for the procedure. He was running late. So I ended up sitting like for an hour waiting for this procedure. And I was thinking, I was thinking about our class tonight. And I was thinking 
for example, of what I'm recommending you do on Shabbat, I took advantage of, of the doctor's office to think about turning points in my life that are almost impossible to explain. My whole life is, com is comprised of turning points that are impossible to explain. And I say to myself, I know I'm not Moses. I know I'm not Eliyahu, Elijah the prophet. If I were, then I would say, I guess these things happen to me because I'm Moses. Moshe Rabbeinu, I'm Eliyahu. I guess that's why God intervenes in my life miraculously in a way that he doesn't for anybody. I would say that if I were that. Actually, if I were that, I'd be too humble and modest to think of myself. Moshe Rabbeinu probably never thought of himself as Moshe Rabbeinu. Vaish Moshe Anav Ma'od, he was the most humble of men. So I, I figure if I'm not Moses and I'm not Elijah and God does it for me, he probably does it for everybody. The only difference between everybody else or a lot of people and me is I've developed a kind of sixth sense. Not that I'm a prophet. I just, I've learned to see the hand of God. I want to give you an example. I did not want to be a lawyer. It's a lovely, noble profession, but I wanted to be a rabbi. My first wife wanted me to be a lawyer, and it was an ongoing thing. And for the first 10 years, I got it my way. And the rest of that marriage, she got it her way. And then after the divorce, I became a rabbi again. Um, and then Ellen came in my life. It was, and, and then Denise and wonderful stuff. Okay. So I look back on my law career. My law career was sabotaged every step of the way. And I want to say it was by God. I could point to other reasons. I Today, I came out of the doctor's office convinced God sabotaged my law career. I want to tell you how. And I'm not going to waste a lot of time. I'm doing it only for the teaching of tonight to inspire you on Shabbat to do the same. My first law position was at Jones Day. It's a big law firm, very respected. And I first was there in the summer of 94. And I had a very good summer. They loved me and I loved them. Had a really good time. Everybody knows they treat you well during the summer before you actually start working there. Then they show the real face. It's sort of like dating. And then you get married. Not pre present company, not included. Um, and so, and also Ellen was straight from the beginning. Day one, you knew exactly who she was. Anyway, I come to Jones Day and there was one Jewish partner in the whole office because Jones Day does not have Jewish partners. They have a lot of Jewish associates, but somehow the Jews never get promoted to partner. Instead, people, not joking, people whose last name is starts with M, small c, Mc, Irish, one after another, McCart, uh, McLoon, and McKnight, and Tom McMahon, and Dan McMillan, and I could list 20 Mix. And I don't say Mick in a, in a disrespectful way about Irish. I'm saying names that st start M, small c, I could just go on and on, uh, just like 15 in litigation whose name started M MC. Jews, Adam Siegler, he never made partner. Doe Fisher, I, I got out when the going was good. I know other Jews who were associates did not stay for partner. Okay. Howard Steinberg was the one Jewish partner. He never got lit, raised up within Jones Day, but he was a bank bankruptcy lawyer, and he had a, what they call a book of business. He had millions of dollars of, worth of clients. And so that kind of Jew they would take in. Howard knew what was cooking in that place. And he saw my yarmulke and he came to me and he asked me if I would, if he needed like to have two associates uh, to work with him. And he had one who was a Jew that he brought with him from somewhere else. And he wanted me to be the other one. So we'd have the three Jews in the Jones Day office would work in this one little bankruptcy team. I don't want to do bankruptcy, but somehow I ended up tied in with his secretary, Joy Higgins. Joy was the worst secretary in the entire office. She was a nightmare secretary. Very first day, she comes to me and says, I want you to do, I want you to understand. I'm not like the other secretaries. I don't do Windows. What she didn't tell me is she doesn't do Microsoft anything. So um, she was impossible. I had to do my own photocopying. And let me tell you, when a lawyer is being billed out of $400 an hour, they don't want you billing $400 an hour photocopy. And she ruined my time there. And even though after six months, I got another secretary, 
It never was right at Jones Day. Okay, I took it as my bad. I should have asked for a new secretary right away. I moved over to a place called Heller Ehrman. Here's what happened. I come in, there's like 80 lawyers there. And normally the day that you arrive, they have a big thing for you. The new the newcomer, welcome, Dove Fisher. And for a day, they treat you nice and they have a little party and they welcome you. And then, then they treat you like dirt, like everywhere else. But at least your first day, they treat you nicely. I had the, I had the bad luck, but it was the hand of God. It just so happened that the day I arrived, four attorneys came also to have their first day. They all came from a law firm called Sherman and Sterling. And Sherman and Sterling's LA office closed, and four of them came into Heller Ehrman the same day. So there was a big, big thing when you came in that day, welcome, and a list of four lawyers from Sherman and Sterling. And they didn't welcome me. All right. And then what ended up happening, the way it works at a big firm, is that the partners need help on a case, and they come, they'll, they'll call you or whatever. Do you have time for another case? I need you to work on my case also. And either you have time, you don't have time. Nobody gave me work. Everybody there thought I was, I had come in the day of Sherman and Sterling. So everybody thought I was part of Sherman and Sterling's team. So nobody gave me work. And Sherman and Sterling thought I was part of the other team. So they didn't give me work. And you have to get work. You have to build 2,000 hours. So after about three months, I sat with the uh, managing par partner. I would pick up little scraps. And she told me I'm not aggressive enough. And you have no idea how aggressive I am. You have no idea. Aside from the fact that I was arrested 13 times in my college years for Soviet Jewry, I've got police officers, New York Police Department, who still remember me from 40 years ago. I'm aggressive, okay? I'm a pushy Jew, and I couldn't get any work. So I went to Aiken Gump, the last one. And I went to Aiken Gump, and they loved me, and I loved them. And this was going to be the law firm. That, and a week before the first day, I broke my foot. And I come in there on crutches, and for a month, I'm on crutches. And it was like an image that they hired a guy on crutches. And I'm not a guy on crutches. And it never worked. It never worked. Now, I could tie up three classes of stories about my life, bad and good, that just don't happen to everybody every time. Maybe one job you start, you have a broken foot the week before. It happens. Maybe one job, they give you the nightmare second. It happens. Maybe one job... The day you begin your day, your job, nine other people come in. It happens. But it just was never meant, it was never blessed the way my rabbinic career was blessed. I'd like you to think about that also. To what degree in your life, some of the most important crossroads that you passed in your lives, actually with the hand of God, directing your path in a certain direction. You didn't even know it. Maybe you won't even, maybe you still don't know it till Saturday. You'll sit on Shabbat Friday night and you'll suddenly realize there were certain moments in my life where how I met this person who was an important, maybe my spouse, or how, how I made this decision to move to the city, or how I ended up making some of the things are simply logical. Your name was on LinkedIn, someone offered you a job, it was another city, so you moved to the city. But how many of us actually made a move that really, but for the grace of God, whatever, or we met somebody in the weirdest way, or we almost married somebody, and by the grace of God, something fell through the last minute. And I get into this, that fight in which Avner said, let's let the boys play. What was that all about? It's just not normal. To talk to your enemy in the United States, it's like a general in the United States is going to have a meeting with a general at NATO, and they're going to have some of their respective troops with them, I don't know, and they're going to say, for fun, let them fight with each other. Who does that? But that play fight ended up with people killing themselves, killing each other, ended up with Asael running after Avner, ended up with Avner killing Asael. Should never have happened. And after Avner killed Asael, 
that's set in motion. The family of Asael, the two remaining brothers, Yoav and Avishai, were determined to kill Avner. And Avner represents the house of Saul, and the others represent the house of David. And from that, the house of David will come triumphant over the house of Saul, and the house of Saul will depart from the monarchy. God is going to allow and instigate events that will finally move David from the king over one tribe to the king over all of Israel. There's a Radak, and here we begin with text. Radak Rav David Kimchi was one of the great uh, commentators. Um, let's just get this. Let's see. Instead of putting it there, let's let's pull something else up. He was one of the great commentators, Radak, and he was commenting on. Let's come on. Uh, let me just uh, took a chance with some the way I want to set this up, and let me just figure out which one to open. Uh, try that. Okay, that that should end up working. Um, because that's going to take that off the screen. Just give me a second. And with that off the screen, we get to Radak. Here we go. Ralbach. Ralbach. Okay. So Ralbach is commenting on the Pasuk that we learned. We learned that that Avner essentially coronated and made Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, the king over all Israel, except for the tribe of Yehuda. Ishbosheth ben Shaul ben Yisrael. Ishbosheth was was forty years old when he became king over all of Israel, except for Judah. Yehuda, Ushtaim Shani Molach, and he ruled for two years. Achbeit Yehuda Hayu Achrei David, but David had the had the following of the house of Yehuda. Okay, by him is Bar Hayamim, and let me just Baruch Atanu Klam Shakam and Baruch. Excuse me. By him is Bar Hayamim, Asher Hayad David Melech BeChavron. And, <clears throat> got it. and the length of time that David was king, based in Hebron, last week we did a walking tour of Hebron. Sheva uh, Shanim Bishisha Harashim, seven and a half years, seven years, six months. So Ral Bag asks, Ral Bag asks about that. He says, if if after Saul, Ishboshet was king for two years, and David was in Hebron seven and a half years before he moves on to Jerusalem. So what he says, what was going on? Is the idea that Ishboshet was king for two years, and David was king those two years and stayed five and a half more years in Hebron? Or is it that there was no king at all for five and a half years, and then Ishbosheth became king for two years until he died when David became moved over to Jerusalem? Let me try to make it clearer with the text. It says that Ishbosheth was 40 years old when he became king, and he was a king for two years. And I'm trying to understand, Rabag says, if David was king seven and a half years before he went to Jerusalem, two of which years overlap Ishbosheth, what was the other five and a half years? Why was he in Hebron? Why didn't he go to Jerusalem? What was going on? If Ishbosheth was not king, like, I would understand if Ishbosheth was king seven and a half years, and David was king over Judah seven and a half years, and then something happened to end Ishbosheth, and then David moves to Jerusalem. I understand that. But if you're telling me Ishbosheth was only two years, David seven and a half years, 
I mean, I only I can only stand to understand it one out of three ways. He says, let's let's understand this. Im she yamtin avnir lahamlicha wachare mocho chamishan in vachatsi. One possibility is Avner chose not immediately to raise Ishbosheth to be king of Israel. Perhaps Avner waited five and a half years and sort of as a military leader, not like it was a military coup, but in the, de- in the, abs- in the aftermath of Saul dying, maybe Avner just waited five and a half years before making his son Ishbosheth king. Maybe what was happening was Avner waited five years, five and a half years, and maybe would not have named Ishbosheth king at all. Maybe Avner himself intended after Saul died, Israel will have no king, and I, as the chief of staff of the military, I'll keep an eye on things. And then, as Avner maybe saw that David was gaining more and more power and authority um, within Judah, maybe five and a half years into the period after Saul died, maybe Avner then decided, I better fill the vacuum and establish Ishbosheth as a king, because David otherwise is going to emerge as the king over everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Just one moment. <clears throat> Again, I'm sorry. Inyan Hashani, a second possibility to understand why why was there that a gap of five and a half years where David is reigning in Judah, but there's no king at all over Benjamin. So he's saying maybe he says the second possibility is that immediately after Saul died, maybe Avner made Ishbosheth the king. Even as immediately after Saul died, David became king over Judah. And maybe when Ishbosheth died two years later, Maybe at that point, Avner decided to wait five and a half more years before conceding that the monarchy had left the house of Benjamin, the house of Saul. So the first thought, maybe he did not name any king five and a half years and then named Ishbosheth, as David was becoming more and more powerful in Judah. Second opinion, maybe he initially named Ishbosheth over everybody. And then when Yishbosheth died two years later, maybe at that point, Avner waited five and a half years uh, and felt that he didn't know what to do exactly. But Rab- Rabak says, I don't think that's what happened. Gam kein rachok ma'od be'enai. I don't think so. I think here's what happened. Why was there so much time? I think if you look carefully, I think for the first two years after Saul died, the house of David and the house of, of, of Saul, Ishbosheth, lived side by side in peace, and they had no war. I think they were both peaceful, Vagam Ata with an iron, Lohoyata Shah Melchama Zulati, Mashahi Iravnir Me Inyana Melchama. The only the only blip was when Avner made that horrible suggestion that why don't the soldiers go and play fight? But other than that, there was no basis of war. And it is my opinion, Robach says, David himself, now it's two years into David, David's reign in Yehuda. And Ishbosheth dies after two years. And David chooses not to make a move to raise, to raise himself up in the vacuum to be a king over all of Israel. He chooses not to seek more than just the tribe of Yehuda. Why? 
Lo hiskim lerdov beit Shaul v'zaro. David did not agree to challenge or pursue the house of Saul and their offspring, their children. Achshamarlo hashvua shenishvalo shaloya shmidit shemo. Rather, David honored the vow he made in God's name that he would never do anything with his hands. He would never do anything to exterminate the house of Saul from the face of the earth, to eradicate Saul. That was the question. What will happen when you do become king? If you remember that exchange he had with Saul, and where Saul acknowledged finally, I realize you will be the king. Please promise me, Saul said, you will not, when you become king, take steps to eradicate my family, my house. And David swore he would never do anything to eradicate the house of Saul. So Ravag says maybe what happened was when after two years Ishbosheth died, two years into David being the king in Hebron, he did not act to take all control because he chose not to take any steps, but to honor his vow, never to try by his actions to eradicate the house of Saul. David instead decided, if God wants me to be king over all of Israel, I've been anointed by Samuel, by Shmuel Hanavi, the prophet Samuel. And if God really wants me, of course he does, and I know he does, I'm going to wait for him to make things unfold. That's why I began class tonight talking about how God often makes things unfold in our lives for his reasons, things that don't have to happen, but that do happen as part of a greater plan that we ourselves are not planning. But it was just meant to be that we should follow a certain course in our lives. And David did not want to speed up God's plan. God wants me to be king. He's had me anointed. He'll make things unfold. I promised Saul that when he's dead, I will do nothing to speed up the clearing out of his house. I will wait until God chooses, and I will not speed up the, 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 the course of destiny. And then Avner made that terrible decision to um, have the soldiers play fight with each other. And that led to the killing of Asael. And that led to the family of Yoav determining they're going to kill Avner. And it led to a number of things happening that ended up opening the kingship of all of Israel, the monarchy of all of Israel to David. And now we go back into our main text, from where from where we left off with the um, with the death of uh, of with, with Avner um, killing Asael, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we continue. By Kayo up a shofar, by Amdu Kol Ha'am, and show they decided that's the end of this horrible fight between the men of Yoav and Avner. And Yoav blew the shofar that signaled retreat. Even though Yoav's men were ascendant in the battle, he didn't want to wipe out Avner's men. He had no stomach for Jews fighting Jews. As he had said in verse 27, Chavzayin, Yoav Elohim ki dibarta. When Avner said, how long will you delay ordering your troops to stop the pursuit of our men. And Yoav said, in the name of God, if only you had thought about that and spoken that way earlier today. Because have you not started up, everybody would have gone their own way. The house of David would have gone their way. The house of Saul would have gone their way, even though we happened to encounter each other. We wouldn't have had a fight. We would have gone to our respective capitals and wherever. And this is what you brought on us. All right, we're going to retreat. 
And the Arava is east of the Jordan River. The dry land uh, that today is the country of Jordan. It's part of the land of Israel. And he went, it says that he went to the Arava. That would be like over here. So he went to Machanaim. They retreated to Machanaim east of the Jordan River. And the people of, um, of David's house went towards Judah, where they had been. Okay. By Avrud Ayardain, the house of Saul people crossed the Jordan, and, so, and they went to Machanaim. And Yoav went his way. And then they did counts. How many people died in today's fighting? By Pakdu may have they David Tisha Sar Yishvasael. From the house of David, twenty men died, nineteen plus Asael. The commentators ask, why doesn't it just say twenty died? To emphasize that the death of Asael was a particular tragedy. Every Jew dying at war is a tragedy. Jews dying at war at the hands of other Jews is an unspeakable tragedy. But the death of Asael was just over-the-top tragedy. In all, from the house of David, on this horrible day, 20 died. 12 in the play fight, quotation marks, and another eight. Va'avdei David, hiku bebinyamen uvan she'avner. And on the other side of the equation, David's men slew from the house of Benjamin, from the men of Avner, shlosh me'ot v'shishimish metu. They killed 360. So they, they routed the house of Saul. They lost 20. They killed 360. And the house of David, there was like a national burial, a national day of mourning, where they took Asael and they buried him in the uh, family plot of the Tsuruya family. This was uh, Tsuruya was the father, and they buried him in the father's family plot, in the tomb. Asher Bethlehem, in Bethlehem. And then they went all night marching till daylight lit up for them the city of Hebron. So this makes sense because if you think about it, they buried him in Bethlehem. They encountered each other in just on this side of the Benjamin line. They brought him to be buried with his family plot in Bethlehem. Makes sense because it's within the boundaries of Yehuda, of David's territory. And then they marched all night long to Hebron, the capital city, where they then realigned, they regathered with David. Okay. Chapter 3. The genie was taken out of the lamp. And now they're at war. A war that never had to be. There's now a civil war going on. Between the house of Saul. Avner is the chief of staff, but it's still called. And Ishboshet is the king, but it's called the house of Saul. Uven Beit David and the house of David. And as they keep fighting... David and his house become stronger and stronger, and Saul weaker and weaker. And that happens. It takes a long time. Sometimes a battle takes a long time. Um, for example, in the United States Civil War, North fought the South. And slowly but surely, over five years, particularly after General Grant, took command from his predecessors like, like Joseph Hooker and George McClellan and those, when he took over from McClellan, Me, uh, Hooker and Meade and, and Burnside, um, once General Grant took over, everything changed. And the North got stronger and stronger, still sustaining significant battle losses, but over the course of time, stronger and stronger. And the Confederacy, after Gettysburg, started going weaker and weaker. It still went on two more years. Gettysburg was the 4th of July, 1863, was the day they fell, I believe. 
And uh, the war ended two years later in 1865. So, but it's a slow progression. Doesn't happen overnight. We're watching it right now in Gaza, that everybody initially was warning that there's going to be, the Jews are going to get massacred. The Israelis are going to get massacred. They're going to go into Gaza City and Hamas is waiting for them. And they're going to go here and they're going to go there and they're never going to make it to Khan Yunus. And if they get to Khan Yunus, now they don't talk about it that way anymore. You forget, many of us forget. Everybody was predicting that the IDF were going to get massacred. No one was saying, don't go into Gaza because you might hurt the Gazans. Now that IDF has been cutting through like, like a knife through butter through each of these places, now the world is saying, don't go into Rafiach because they know it's not the IDF that's going to get massacred. So now that it seems like the Jews are not the ones getting massacred, now everybody wants a ceasefire. It's like the 1967 Six-Day War. Um, Israel won the war the first day, really. It wasn't even a six-day war. First day, Israel wiped out the Egyptian and Syrian air forces. Israel had complete control of the sky. However, because the Arabs lie, Egypt publicly was announcing, as was Syria, we are killing Israel. Everybody knew there was a war, and they all were saying, we're winning, and the Israelis are days away from being driven into the sea. So the United Nations did not try to stop the war. Only when it became impossible, Chaim Herzog at the time was Israel's ambassador to the UN. And he explained afterwards, long after the war, he said the dilemma was, our strategic dilemma was, how do we keep secret that we're winning? Because as soon as the United Nations finds out that we're winning, they're going to pass a ceasefire. Security count. As long as they think we're being wiped out, they're not going to act. So it was a strategic decision. Don't let them know we're winning until we took the Temple Mount. Couldn't hide it anymore. If, if we're three days away, one minute away from being driven in the city, how do we end up with the Temple Mount? And once we couldn't hold the secret anymore, they had an emergency session the same day, and they passed a resolution for a ceasefire. And that's what it is now. Soon as it became clear that Israel's winning, now they want a ceasefire. But that's what happened there. There it wasn't about the UN. It was Jews fighting Jews. And the House of David is getting stronger and stronger. And as they're getting stronger, it's very important. They the text takes a segue for a very important reason. It is extremely important, based on some of the classes coming up, to know about David's family. David had a household of seven wives, or six. You'll see what I'm talking about in a moment. Six or seven wives. And he had a son from basically each one. Let's see if I could find quickly my sheet that I prepared for you. Here we are. Let's just make it a little easier to see. We'll just bold it. Okay. So David, and this is the order that the text is going to tell us, and we're going to learn it soon. David married Achinoam and Avigail. You'll remember that. Avigail was the widow of Naval the Carmelite, that gruff and, uh, and, and, and rough guy. He would not share his wealth or any food with David on the day that his men were celebrating the end of the sheep shearing season. Shearing, S-H-E-A-R-I-N-G. And then Avigail knew that David is going to come and kill her husband so to save her husband, she raced, and she got food, and she got bread, and she got wine, and she had a retinue come with her and bring it to David so that David would not kill her husband to get that bread and wine and water. And when her husband, Naval, found out what she did, he had a stroke and died. He was that much of a miser. And when David learned that she's a widow, he married her. And it told us in the same sentence, I've gone through it a few times, so I'm not pulling up that verse, that Pasuk now. There was also Achinoam of Jezreel. And we talked the previous class about Yisrael. Even though it sounds like Yisrael, Jezreel sounds like Israel, we saw it's a completely different word. Je Yisrael is Yisra, Zerah is seed. Yisrael, God will plant seed. And it's called the Emek Yisrael, the 
Emek, the Valley of Jezreel, because it's so rich and fertile. It's like God's miraculous planting of, 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 a, of a valley. And Achinoam was in Jezreel, and we saw Jezreel is near Carmel. It's in the northern part of Israel. Let's see if I can pull it up for you really, really quickly, just so that we picture it again. But we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, let's just find that map. Okay. Didn't work last time, and that didn't work this time. Okay. It should be over here. And let's just find that map really quickly. So we just refresh our memories of the maps. All right. Yeah. And so here's Jezreel, northern Israel. It's the entire valley from left to right, west to east. And it's named, it main city there is Jezreel. But it runs all the way from Mount Carmel, which is here, to the Jordan River. And so David was up there and he married those two women. And then he married more, the text tells us. And we're going to look at it again, because it's an important text here. The, the son of Achinoam, his, uh, his son with Achinoam, he named Amnon, Amnon. It's still a name that you see from time to time among Jews. In fact, Albertsons in their frozen kosher food section has Amnon pizza. So the name Amnon is still out there. Avigail, <clears throat> he named that son Kilav. That's a name you don't really see much. You do see occasionally Kalev, or in English, Caleb. You don't see Kilav. It's a slightly different name because it's also got a uh, slightly different spelling. Kuflam and Aleph Bays instead of Kuflam and Bet. Um, so he had Amnon and Kilav. Then he had a third wife, Ma'acha, daughter of Talmai, the king of Geshur. <clears throat> daughter of Talmai, the king of Geshur. So he married the daughter of a foreign king. Obviously, she converted to be Jewish. He wasn't going to be married to a woman who wasn't Jewish. Um, and through Ma'acha, he had his third son, Avshalom. That's a very common name still, English Absalom. Then he married Chagit. He had Adonia. He married Avital. That's a name you still see a lot. You still see Chagit as a woman's name and Avital. You see those names. You see Avigail, Abigail. And that son is named Shvatya. And you don't see that name much. He married another wife, Egla, through whom he had Yitra'am. <clears throat> So we have six sons, Amnon, Kilav, Avshalom, Adonia, Shafatya, and Yitra'am. And I was preparing this right before class, so let's just uh, fix that a little. And then he marries, then he marries Michal, the daughter of King Saul. Just put that over there. Okay. And let's give that the right color so we don't mix it up. Okay, good. Now, Michal, let's remember Michal. So that's the six sons. Amnon is going to have a major part in the storyline. Kilav won't. Absalom, major, major story. Adonia, major, major player. But Shafatya, Yitraam, and Kilav do not play major roles. And Michal, let's remember who Michal, daughter of King Saul. That's a story we discussed long ago. And let's go back and remember, because this is important as part of understanding what's going on here with David. Okay, let's try to pull that up. And let's take that out of the way. Um, let's find, okay. In chapter 18 of Shmuel Allah, 1 Samuel, uh, after David killed Goliath and became nationally popular to the degree that Saul was, was afraid of him. He's too popular. I don't like it. I don't like, he's a threat to my rule, even though Saul was king of Israel and David was a young man. Um, Saul decides, I want to keep an eye on this guy. I don't like it. When Saul saw that David was successful, he dreaded him. 
And therefore, I want to keep an eye on him. I want to have one of my daughters marry him. That way, it will deter him from trying to take me down. That's a name you still see for some women, Merav. Saul takes his oldest daughter, older daughter, Merav, and decides, I'm going to give her to you as a wife. I want you to continue being part of my army and even being one of my leading generals and fighting God's wars. And Saul quietly was thinking, I want to kill him, but I don't want to be the one to kill him. I'm going to put him in the battlefront as a general. I'll let the Philistines kill him and do my dirty work, not even realizing they're doing it for me. David was just, he had no idea that there's a subterfuge here. He was, he was humbly taken by this. Who am I? I'm a nobody. That I should be the king's son-in-law? Wow. And as Saul was about to give Merav to David as a wife, Something unfolded, and we learned it way, way, way time ago. For now, we're not going to get into that because it take a, too much time. We learned it in the past. Um, you can find all our past programs on YouTube, and I try to have a little intro at the beginning to say which verses. So this is from 1 Samuel 18, 19. And so Merav was given to Adriel. So Saul gave his next daughter to David instead, Michal. But to have Michal bat Shul David, vayagidu l'shul. Michal, the next daughter, she loved David. She had a passion for David. They told Saul, but Yishad davar b'yenav, and he liked that. That was good. That was good. Vayom l'shul et nenolo to hilo l'mokesh. Saul said to himself, I will give her to David, and she will be a stumbling block. She will she will be a stumbling block to him. Utehivo yat pushed him. Through her, I will execute my plan to have David killed by the Philistines. And so Saul said, you know what? You, David, can become my chosen, my chatan, my son-in-law today by marrying Shtayim, by marrying my second daughter. And so that's what ended up happening. He married Michal. And to refresh your memory, after a period of time, Saul took her, took her away from David. She saved David's life. There was that incident where Saul sent his soldiers to the palace, not the palace, but to the building where David was living for the purpose of arresting him and killing him. And to refresh your memory, Michal saved David's life. She knew the plan was to kill him. And so first uh, they did that uh, Ferris Bueller thing where they put they put uh, like a body on a bed and covered it with a blanket to make it look like someone is sleeping in bed, like that scene in Ferris Bueller. And then she lowered David from the window, tied bed sheets together, and he sneaked out the window and got away. And when the generals came, they saw he was sleeping. And then later when Saul said to them, bring, wake him up and bring him, I want him dead. And then they pulled a blanket and he wasn't there. And Saul was furious. And one of the ways Saul dealt with that fury is he took Michal, his daughter, who was married to David, and he pulled her away, not literally, but figuratively, and gave her to Palti ben Laish, Palti, the son of Laish. And we learned that, and I don't want to take out too much time on that either. But what happened... After the death of Saul, when Ishboshet became king, supported by Avner, there came a point where David demanded, did not request but demanded, I want my wife back. I want my Michal back. He has six wives. I want her back also. Remember, a king of Israel was allowed to have like 18 wives. Um, 
he has seven. I And he's going to have more because you don't even have to be a Bible scholar to have heard of David and Bathsheba, Bathsheba. So he's going to have at least one more. He wants me to back. And at the time, we learned Midrashim. To, again, we just can't take out the time tonight. But you could look it up again on the YouTube around the same chapter. Um, we discussed how can you take the wife of a man and give her to another man? That's adultery. And we explained that she never actually, according to the Midrash, never actually was married to Palti. She was given to Palti, but she never was married to Palti. There are other Midrashim that talk about it in different ways also. Whether she may be, the, the idea is that Palti was a big tzaddik, and he knew in his mind he's been given an eshatish. She, he's been given a married woman. He's not allowed to do that. It's adultery. So he never touched her. And therefore, the Talmud remembers him as one of the great tzaddikim, one of the great righteous people of all time, because here he is, he's got a woman in his home, and the king says you can do with her as a husband, and he does not do that. And in fact, the Gemara talks about it in Sanhedrin, uh, Mesechet Sanhedrin, Folio 19b, Amud Daf Yutet Amud Bet, they talk about him. Ketiv Palti, you Ketiv Palti El. You know, some of the Hebrew names in the Bible sometimes are written full, sometimes are written a little bit abbreviated. Like uh, there's Yeshaya is Isaiah, but sometimes it's called Yeshayahu, and sometimes Yeshaya without that who. There's uh, there's Yermia and Yermiahu, same person, Jeremiah, sometimes referred to as Yermia, sometimes Yermiahu. The Yahu is a biblical suffix for certain Hebrew names. That's how the uh, Netanyahu, the uh, current uh, prime minister of Israel, his father took on the name from the exile. He changed his name to a Hebrew name, and he took on the name Netanyahu. He could have taken on the name Netanya, but there's a city named Netanya. So then he would be asked, seriously, be asked, why did you take on the name Netanya? Are you from Netanya? So he took on the name Netanyahu. Just as Yermia, Yermiahu, Eliyahu. So there's, in the same way, sometimes this man in whose custody Michal lived is called Palti, and sometimes it's called Paltiel. So the Gemara says, asks, Ketiv Palti, Ketiv Paltiel. Somewhere it's called, he's called Palti. Like, for example, in 1 Samuel 25, verse 44. So if it comes up real quick, which it doesn't, so forget that. So in 1 Samuel 25, 44, He's referred to as Palti. What am we talking? We just we just saw it uh, when it says I just read it. Isn't it? Oops, wrong one. Okay, now I forget it. So it's called some Paltiel, and then elsewhere it's called Palti. Velama nekra shemo Paltiel, she Palto el minhavera, because God the word Paltiel means that God saved him. Um, Plata is, uh, is, is like a remnant that survives. She'erita Plata, the last who survived, survivor. Paltiel, the one whom God assisted in surviving. She'polto el minavera. God, God helped him survive, uh, descending into the sin. Ma'asa, what did Paltiel do? How did he avoid acting as a husband with Michal, since the two of them were alone under the same roof? In the bed, he put a sword between her and him. He made that a permanent warning to himself. Whoever crosses across this sword in this bed, will be destined to be slaughtered with the sword, whether literally or in the world to come for committing adultery. So he would not touch her. And now that Saul was dead, David took her back. So we're told in the text, by Evaldula David Banim Hebron, while David was king for seven and a half years in Hebron before going to Jerusalem, he had children. He had sons, Ben, Banim, 
Amnon. His firstborn was Amnon, La Achinoma Israelite, born to Achinoam of Jezreel. I just read it. Mishnehu Kilav. La Avigail, Eshet Navala Carmeli. His second was Kilav. The Hashlishi of Shalom ben Ma'acha Batalmai Melch Geshur. And his third son is Absalom, the son of Ma'acha, from the house of Talmai, the king. The Horavi Adonia ben Chagitva Hamishi Shafatya ben Avita. And his fourth son was Adonia. And his fifth son, uh, the son of Chagit, the fifth and the and the fifth one was Shvatya ben Avital, and his sixth was Yitra Amla Egla Eshet David. Egla, his sixth wife, some say that was Michal, others say that was not Michal, but a separate woman named Egla. Ela Yuldula David Bechevron, and those were David's sons that were born in Hebron. The Midrash is particularly interested in the name Kilav, the second son born, the one born to Abigail. Abigail. I told you we're going to find Amnon, Amnon is a major player coming up. And I told you so will be Adonia, and so will be Absalom. Absalom. They will be major, uh, major players. Absalom and uh, Adonia, together with Amnon. The, the Midrash is fascinated by this name, Chilav. It's not a regular name. It means like his father, like his father. You know, it's interesting. The uh, the Ashkenazic Jews do not name their their sons after the father. You don't have junior among Ashkenazim. Uh, with non-Jew, like it, it's I won't say it's common, 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 but it's common enough uh, to meet people named junior. And once in a while, a junior names his son after. And then it becomes so and so the second, so and so the third. Um, Ashkenazim do not name children for the father or for any living person. We name in memory of someone who is deceased, or we make up a name. You're allowed to do that also, the way they did in the Bible, Tanakh. And that's done normally for a deceased parent, God forbid, my son Aharon his name for my father who passed away when I was 14. Um, Lisa Nunn, Lisa Pearl, the lady who had triplets, named one of her three daughters Ellen in memory of my wife who passed away. Ellen. Um, and that's what Ashkenazim do. Sephardim do name from time to, they don't have to, but they do from time to time name for someone Who's it for their parent? So Chilav, the second son of David, he doesn't name him David Jr. He names him a name like his father. What's that about? And you know, you can meet it's like it's like the junior thing. You hope your son maybe will come out like you, um, assuming assuming you're good. Well, let's see what that's about. The Midrash actually, and this is the last learning for tonight. Very interesting. Um, let's find that midrash. Here we go. For that, I first have to remind you. Um, let's see. Chapter 20 of Breshit in the book of Genesis, chapter 20. Time of Abraham. Abraham encountered a famine in the land of Israel. Then it was known as land of Canaan, Eretz Canaan, Canaan. Couldn't be called land of Israel. Israel, the alternative name of Yaakov, Jacob, had not yet been born. That name wasn't even out there yet. It was Canaan. And it was hit by famine. And Abraham left Canaan and he went to the Negev. And so he went down to the Negev. The Negev is down here. It says the Negev. So Abraham, of course, the land was not yet broken into 12 tribes. They're based on the 12 sons of Yaakov, and Yaakov hasn't been born, so neither have they. But the land was not known as the land of Simeon yet, Shimon. Rather, it's the land of, it's the Negev, it's the south. Negev means dry. Magevet is a towel. The Negev is to dry your hands. Negev is dry because it's the desert. That's why they always talk about how Israel made the desert bloom. Okay. 
So Abraham went down to the de desert on the area near the Gaza Strip, um, and he went there. So we have a history we've been learning and learning and learning. The more you learn the Bible, Tanakh, the more you realize Gaza is part of Israel, and it's always been. And the Arab Muslims didn't even exist as Muslims till the 600s, 7th century. And uh, we were there a thousand years before. Anyway, so Abraham is in Gerar, in the Negev, with his wife, Sarah. And he's afraid that the locals will end up murdering him so that they can take his wife and do with her as they would do with a woman, because they're savages. More things change, the more things don't change. But interestingly, they are religious savages, so they'll rape women, but not a married woman. That's adultery. So first they'll murder the husband, and then they'll take the woman. Therefore, he was telling people not to... Sarah is his wife, but Achoti, she's my sister. So Avimelech, who was the king of Gerar, sent people to bring this woman, Vaishlach Avimelech Melch Gerar Vekachetzar. They said she's gorgeous. She's for the king. And since she's the sister traveling with her brother, there's not an adultery issue. So the king sent for her. And that night, God came to Avimelech in a dream and spoke to him in such a vivid dream. It was, clear, it was clearly a prophecy. And God said, basically, you deserve right now for me to strike you dead for taking a married woman. She's a married woman. Avimelech says, Lo Avimelech had not physically touched her yet and says, are you going to kill an, a tzaddik, a, a righteous man, with an evil man? I didn't do anything. He said, she's my sister. And so I did, and God says, I know. I know you acted in innocence, not realizing she's uh, married. And therefore, I protected you. You thought tonight you did not physically engage her because you were tired? I made a special exhaustion hit you so that you would not engage her physically tonight. I protected you. You didn't really, back to what I said at the beginning of class, things happen in our lives for a reason. Things that we don't even, he's exhausted. People get exhausted. Tonight I'm exhausted. I have a headache. God protected him, that he should not do anything that would bring sin on him. And also he protected the purity of our first matriarch, Sarah. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. So well, here's what God says. You better give her back because you took the wife of a prophet. And you better hope he'll pray for you to recover or you'll die. So restore the man's wife. He's a prophet. He'll intercede for you. He'll, he'll pray for you. And you'll live. And if you don't, know surely that you will die. You and all of yours. And so Avimelech returns Sarah untouched and returns her with lots of wealth. And that's how Abraham becomes rich. Until that day, Avraham was not rich. Overnight, he became the richest of people in the world. Because overnight, to induce him to pray for Avimelech's healing, <laughs> excuse me, and well-being, he gave him extraordinary wealth. And again, you look back in life, how did you get the money that you might have to pay your bills? Was there some job or something in your life that at the time seemed like good luck? And maybe God was unfolding your journey in that case, Avimelech took sheep and oxen, male and female slaves, gave them to Avraham, and he made him the richest of men. Well, it's very interesting because in chapter 25, five chapters later, that's Genesis 20. I'm wrapping up. 
Genesis 25, five chapters later, at the beginning of Toldot, it tells us, the Eilat Toldot Yitzchak ben Avraham, Avraham only Yitzchak. After the life of Abraham, he dies. Yitzchak is born. And it tells us the story's moving on now to Isaac, Yitzchak. And these, we're about to tell you now, uh, is the story of Yitzchak, the son of Abraham. And then it says, Abraham gave birth to Yitzchak. Whoa! Why do we need these three extra words? Avraham only Yitzchak, four extra words. It just said Yitzchak, the son of Abraham. Why say, and Abraham gave birth to Yitzchak? Rashi explains, Avraham holidit Yitzchak. Al yedei shekatav v'katuv Yitzchak ben Avraham. Inasmuch as the Torah already said, Yitzchak, the son of Abraham, right? Yitzchak ben Avraham. Inasmuch as the text already said that. So why is it further saying that... Uh, Let's just get that Rashi back. Okay. So, Al-Yat, since it says Yitzchak said Avraham, who's Kakluma Avraham Olidit Yitzchak, so why did the Torah then say, and Abraham gave birth to Yitzchak? Lefisha Hayulet Sonei Hador, because low lives, every generation has its share of low lives, who speak are low lives, and they speak slander, and they joke around. And there would have been low lives, Omrim me Avi Melchnet who would have said that that Isaac, the son of Abraham and Sarah, had been that that Sarah actually had been impregnated by Avi Melech. In the passage I just read you, people would have said he's no second patriarch of the Jewish people, he's not the son of Abraham, he was born to Sarah, but he's the son of Avi Melech. Because after all, how many years and years and years was Sarah married to Abraham? Decades. And she never got pregnant until the miracle of the three angels that came by. And one of them prophesied that next year she'll be pregnant with a child. The average low life. You've all encountered low lives. You know who I'm talking about. Just think of him in your mind. A low life would say, I don't think he was born to Abraham. I think he was born to Abimelech. So what did God miraculously do? He made the face of Yitzchak be the spitting image of Abraham. You know, sometimes when a baby is born, oh, he looks like his mother, looks like his father, her mother, her father. And really... I mean, I remember when my my first child was born and my in-laws were on the phone. Who, who does he look like? Well, who does she look like? I mean, the kid just came out of the womb. The kid looks like a mouse. Uh, the afterbirth, the kid looks like afterbirth. The kid is all gray. And if you insist, who does he look like? A little bit like Bart Simpson. I mean, what do you want from me? I don't know who he looks like. Oh, because like in that family, it was like very important. The kid's got to look like like my wife. So I said what they wanted to hear. Looks like my wife. He's a boy, just like my wife. So um, God made a miracle that Yitzchak's face was identical to Abraham's, so that no one could die. And that way, not only does it say Yitzchak is the son of Abraham, but the text reemphasizes Abraham gave birth to Yitzchak. No one could deny it. Because that was the testimony. And in the same way, we're going to learn Next week, we'll stop now for time, but we're going to learn in the same way that when, um, when Kil'av was born, God made a miracle that Kil'av would look like Avigail. And why do you suppose? And we'll learn it in the text. Why do you suppose? Because the late son Ehador, the low lives, the low lives and the slanderers and the jokers, would say of King David, all right, he had a son, I mean, I'm known, but this next one with Abigail, we don't believe that's the son of David. He's probably the son of Naval, that gruff and miser, the Carmelite, whom Avigail was married to before he died. And so God made a miracle, and we'll look in the text next week, that Kilov looked exactly like David. 
the exact same story as what I just told you about Isaac, Yitzchak, and Abraham, so that everybody would know unquestionably that he was the son of David. Next week, we're going to continue with the story of David's emerging family of six sons. He takes back Michal, and then how everything of the last two, three weeks unfolds to move forward the house of David now becoming the king over all of Israel. And we'll be moving forward in the next week or two, the fall of the house of Saul and the fall of Ishbosheth. Thank you very much for being here. And God willing, uh, we'll see you all next Tuesday for Navi. And Thursday, of course, there's the Rambam class. We're learning about Eretz Israel and the centrality of Israel in, in fighting for Israel, Jewish life. And then Sundays, we do our weekly program on the latest news out of Israel. So have a wonderful week and be well. And thanks again for being here. Bye-bye.